I heard the music stop. I think it's time to begin. So welcome, everyone. Good to see the pews full today on this beautiful day here at Beulah Baptist Church. I want to welcome each and every one of you, especially the visitors that are visiting with us and worshiping with us today. And um, let's begin with a word of prayer this morning. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that so many have come to worship you today, Father. We come with open hearts. We come caring about loved ones. We come bringing prayers, Father, for those that are sick, that are in our families and in our communities. And we come, Father, asking your healing hand to be upon them. We come, Father, to bring you glory and praise, to sing hymns, Father, of praise to your name. We come to strengthen our spirits, Father, because the world around us is full of perils. We need your help. We need your guidance. We need your leadership to do the battle that we need to do each and every day, the fight for what we believe in, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. So, Father, help us with that. Inspire us today. Help our pastor that has come to bring the message open our hearts to the Word of God that we might be better ministers in our community. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now I would begin with our opening hymn this morning, hymn number 411, "'Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus." If you would, so all please stand. We're so happy to again today to have Dr. Gordon Fort with us to bring the message this morning. You remember he preached on the power of prayer a few weeks ago to us and 
you know, I, that, that message just really, I talked to a bunch of the members that, that are around and it just really spoke to them uh, these past few weeks. We, we, you know, have been in prayer for a lot of different things and it, it just showed us that the power of prayer is the strongest tool that we have to uh, go about our business for the Lord. So I'll ask him now if he would come and bring the rest of the message. Thank you, sir. Well, it's good to be back. It's a privilege to be here, honored to be here. Thank you for letting me come back. And if you knew I was coming and you turned up anyway, I really appreciate it. Glad to see you. And I've been looking forward to this morning what the Lord will uh, speak to our hearts about. So let's open with a word of prayer. Father, again, it's good to remember that when we woke up this morning, uh, you were already wide awake. You never sleep, you never slumber. You watch over your creation. You're intimately acquainted with every detail of our lives today. You know everything that's going on. You know our concerns. You know our challenges, you know our problems, you know the difficulties that we're facing. Lord, you know everything about us, and we can trust you. You're a good Heavenly Father. You've called us to pray, to seek your face, that when we call upon you, we will not find a shadow of turning. You don't turn away from your children. And so this morning, we ask you, in this place, as we worship together, sing together, read your word and hear your word, would you meet us at the point of our need? May we just hear from you. May your Holy Spirit teach us your word, and if we need to be exhorted or challenged or corrected, our hearts are open to you. And if we need to learn something that you want us to do, our hearts are open to you. We're willing and ready and able to do everything you want us to do. Whatever the needs in the room, whether there's need for healing, for restoration, for wounds to be healed, for us to have relationships restored that are broken, maybe we have a financial need or a physical need. Well, Lord, would you just meet us at the point of our need? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Let's uh, sing together our offertory hymn, hymn number 483. Hymn number 483.
pray for our offering. Father, today as we give our gifts to you, we just want to thank you that we have anything at all in our pocket that we can invest in your kingdom. We pray that in our hearts you would find us as cheerful givers, recognizing that every good and perfect gift comes from your throne of grace. So, Father, we thank you today for our privilege to give to your kingdom's work. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you have your Bible, if you'll turn with me to Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 3, and our text this morning is verse 19, Acts chapter 3, uh, verse 19. Let me just give a little preamble to this before we read this text so that we get it in its context. Peter and John gone to the temple for their time of prayer. It's the ninth hour. As you read your Bible, sometimes you'll see this, especially in the New Testament, that uh, they'll either use the Roman uh, time frame or they'll use the Jewish time frame. And so you want to make sure you know which one they're using in the text. So this is, this is the Roman time frame. This is about noon. So around noon, Peter and John have gone down to the temple to pray. And as they're on the way to the temple to pray, they pass a lame man who's been brought out by his family who's been waiting for alms. Now, uh, my wife Leanne and I uh, have visited Israel, and the last time we were there, we went to the temple, and there were people who were gathered doing this same thing even today, generally waiting for a handout, waiting for someone to give them something so that they could buy their meal. Generally, uh, if a person was lame, they had no social security. They were dependent upon the goodwill of the people who were going to the temple to pray. He couldn't go inside the temple. His handicap precluded him from being able to go into worship. He had been lame from his mother's womb. So this lame man laying out somewhere along the little trail that goes up to the temple, Peter and John going to the temple to pray. Now they did this regularly from the time uh, Jesus was resurrected. There were three normal times when a Jewish person would go down to the temple for daily prayers. This was the noon hour. You can imagine that this is their regular practice. This isn't the first time they've seen this layman. They passed him pretty regularly on their way to pray. But for some reason, on this particular day, as Peter and John are passing him, they stop. Peter looks at him. Who knows, this guy maybe thinks, well, finally, these cheapskates are going to give me a handout. You ever pass by someone on the road? Uh, in Richmond, sometimes there are some places where guys are standing out there. My favorite one was this lady who was sitting on an upturned paint can with a long stick and a bag attached to it. She wouldn't move. She was reading a book, and when your car came up close enough, she would reach her stick out with that bag. I just have to confess to you, I never put a dime in there. <laughs> and maybe she was like this guy. She'd been watching every day. Is this cheapskate going to give me anything today? Well, this is this lame man, desperate. Peter and John stopped take a look at him. And their response, I find very enlightening. 
Because here's what Peter says. Silver and gold we don't have. Now, that's not what that guy wanted to hear, was it? Silver and gold, we got no money. Pockets are empty. But then he says, but such as we have, we're going to give it to you. And then he got the surprise of his life. Because he thought all he needed was silver and gold. But he got something far better than he expected that day. Peter said, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He reaches down his hand, takes the man by the hand, helps him stand up, and as he's standing up, the scripture says his feet and his ankle bones are healed. Then he gets a little excited. I've never understood why Christians keep their best emotional energy for a football game or a basketball game or any kind of sports. When I would go watch my son play, uh, in Africa he played rugby, I grew up in Africa, you who were here the first uh, couple weeks ago when I preached know the story. Born and raised to missionary parents, then my wife and I served for 20 years in Africa, so my kids were born in Africa. My son played the game of rugby. And I would go to the field, and I can just tell you, I would scream my heart out. I, I was such an involved dad, I, I, I volunteered to be a touch judge so I could get up really close and yell at him if he wasn't doing what I thought he ought to do. Now that's something to do while you're holding up a flag. My favorite time was uh, when they kicked off the ball and I didn't realize they had just watered the field. And the ball went out of bounds and I went running down to mark the spot and I hit the clay and I'm telling you I slid for about 20 feet but at least I had the flag up. <laughs> Well, today, we'd say silver and gold, we have. You see, when I drive downtown to Richmond, I generally have a little cash in my pocket. So I can't say to that guy at the intersection, silver and gold have I none. I can't say that. But here's the sad thing about the church today. We can say silver and gold we have, but we don't have the power to reach out and touch those who need to be healed. We have financial wealth, but we have spiritual poverty. That is a tragic place for the church to be in. We have financial health, but spiritual poverty. Oh, Peter and John, this guy got a little excited and he starts to jump and dance and for the first time in his life, he can go into the temple where worship is taking place. And so he does that. He jumps and leaps. He runs into the temple and it creates a little chaos. People notice that something's different about this guy. And so they uh, come around to see what's going on because they all recognize who he is. They've seen him up there at that uh, entrance as they go to the temple. Many of those worshipers had seen him. They're seeing him up against the wall. And here he is leaping, dancing, and praising God. And uh, they all want to know what's happened. And so the word gets around. It's these two apostles. They took him by the hand and lifted him up and he was healed. And so they're all looking at these two guys as though these men must be something really special. And so Peter then responds and says, now men, and why are you looking at us as though in our name we did this? In other words, they were just saying, we don't have any power of ourselves. We're not some faith healers. We don't have some special medicine. There's not some special product we brought to the temple today that this guy got healed on. We're just like you flesh and blood. But he said, if you want to know how he was healed, he was healed in the name of Jesus. 
And then these bold apostles start to explain to that crowd who he was. And they know who he was. And they said to them and reminded them, this is the Jesus that you guys crucified. You rejected the Holy One of God. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were our fathers. And this was the one who was promised. And he's the one that you killed on a cross. And reminded them, when, 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 when Herod wanted to let him go, you took a murderer in his place and let the innocent man die on a cross. And then they said, but you did it out of ignorance. But it's by faith in that name, the one that God raised from the dead, that this man's healed today. Then we come to this text in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. So listen to what they said. After they had given him this message, so what should you do? Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Now let's talk about this text a little bit. Repentance. What is that? When he said to this group of people gathered to hear their testimony about this lame man who had been healed. And they explained to them how they're responsible for the death of Jesus and that they did it out of ignorance. And after they get through with that testimony, they say, now here's what you need to do because of what you've done. Repent. You know, repentance is a very simple word. It just simply means change your mind. Change your mind. It's a word, metanosis in the Greek, which means to change your knowledge, change your mind. It means that I was headed in one direction, believing one thing. Then I heard something and saw something that changed my understanding and changed my mind and reoriented my life for the rest of my life. It changed the direction of my life. I was headed one way, I heard and had something happen to me, and I turned around and I headed a different direction. I wasn't the same person anymore. That's what repentance is. Then he says, repent, change your mind, and be converted. To be converted doesn't mean to put a patch on something. It doesn't mean to change your garment. What it means is to be converted has change of heart. To be converted, let's make it realistic for us here today. I don't know if you have a church role, but brother, buddy, y'all got a church role where people put their membership name that you keep up with it. You do? We don't sign in on Sunday. Maybe we ought to. You have a church register. It's just a legal account of who's a member and who's not. This was very important to a, friend, uh, a friend's church not too long ago when they had a very contentious vote. They wanted to know who's an actual member here. Oh, I remember as a country pastor, we, we had a little contentious situation. And uh, we, we had a church business meeting. And I tell you, people came to that business meeting I hadn't seen and didn't even know were members of the church because their name was on the roll. We as Baptists, sometimes we think when we sing that old Baptist hymn, when the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there, that that's our church roll. I got news for you. <laughs> it's not our church roll. That is the Lamb's book of life. You better make sure your name just isn't on this church roll at Beulah Baptist. You better make sure your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. That's the only role that counts. To be converted doesn't mean you come to church and put your name on somebody's book. To be converted doesn't even mean you come to church sometime and find yourself in the baptistry. I don't know if any of you uh, brothers or sisters ever did this, but when we were boys uh, in Africa growing up, there was a swamp not far from our house and uh, it was about four or five feet deep. 
And on occasion, when we'd go out there to swim, we'd practice baptizing one another. I got news for you. That baptism did not convert my brothers. <laughs> I'm the middle of the five, and I can assure you, uh, that didn't convert us. You could be baptized a thousand times and not be converted. So you could say this morning, well, Brother Gordon, my name's on the roll. Been on the roll for 30 years or 40 years or 60 years, and I've been baptized. That's not the question today. The question today is, have you been converted? That means, have you been born again? Have you repented? Have you seen a change in your life? Did God give you a new heart? That doesn't mean you're a perfect person. You say, but, well, I'm not perfect. I still make mistakes. Well, I hope so, because you're like the rest of us. But there had to be a time in your life when you believed you were lost and you needed to be saved. You put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, received Him as your Lord and Savior, and you repented and you were converted. Now that's the conversion He's talking about here. He's not asking these Jewish people, uh, just try a little harder and do a little better. That won't work. We need to be converted. You see, friends, it's not that God doesn't appreciate your good deeds. It's just that your good deeds will never be good enough. I, I can't tell you how many conversations I had when I was a country preacher where I'd go out and talk to someone about, uh, about the Lord and they'd say, well, I, I just wish you had known Mrs. So-and-so. She was the best person I ever knew. And let me just tell you something. If she doesn't make it to heaven, ain't nobody going to make it to heaven. Listen, how many lies does it take to qualify as a liar? Just one. How many things do you have to take that weren't yours in order to qualify as a thief? Just one. How many thoughts do you have to think in order for your mind to be corrupted? Just one thought. And from the day you were born and you became aware of your conscience, Satan has sought to destroy you. I wish I could say this morning to each of us as we leave, well, when you leave here, brothers and sisters, as you follow Christ, just let your conscience be your guide. I'm sorry. Your conscience was seared. Oh, when you first became aware of right and wrong, and you did wrong, oh, it bothered you. This last week, I was in Birmingham, Alabama with my little five-year-old grandson, Josiah. And when he disobeys his Mimi, my wife, Leanne, his little conscience really bothers him. All Mimi's got to do is say, Josiah, boy, I'm really ashamed of you. You've really hurt my feelings. You ought to see that little boy, Sulla. I mean, his little old face just gets all, you know, he just about comes to tears. But you know, if he doesn't know the Lord, one of these days when he's 16 or 17, she could say that, and he might spit in her face. Because his conscience is seared. I wish our conscience could guide us. Can't. You can't rely on your conscience anymore. Because our nation, through our media and our social culture, we've been taught that wrong is right and right is wrong. In our nation today, we celebrate those who are sinful. And we hate those who are righteous. You can't let your conscience be your God. You've got only one place that you can go to know right from wrong, and it's the Word of God. And it's the Word of God aided by the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you walk full of the Spirit of God, He'll keep you on the right track. He'll alert you to right and wrong. And when you step over the boundary, He'll prick your conscience, and He'll say to you, that wasn't right. So this morning, it's not about my sin or your sin or whose sin. It's the fact that I needed to be converted by repentance and put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, this is what the apostles, this is the message they're giving to this crowd that's gathered around them. And after they listen to this message, the Spirit of God pricks their hearts. 
And we're told that almost 5,000 men, they didn't count the women, the youngsters who might have been in that mix, but just counted the number of men, said almost 5,000 men were converted that day at the temple. The promise here was when you do that, something's going to happen. When you will be converted by repentance, times of refreshing will come. Now, I'm going to ask you something about this. Because it says that refreshing comes from the presence of the Lord. Now, what were these guys talking about? When they're talking about the presence of the Lord, you have to go back to Exodus chapter 25, and you have to study out what happened with the Ark of the Covenant. When Moses was given his instruction on Mount Sinai, and he was told, you need to build this box out of, out of wood, it's about 32, 36 inches long, about 24 inches deep, about 24 inches wide, covered in gold, and on each end you're to beat out of pure gold these cherubim, these angelic figures, whose wings will spread out over the mercy seat in the middle. And God says, when you do that, this is where I will meet with you. In other words, when Moses would go into the tabernacle in the Old Testament days, in the wilderness wanderings, it was in a tent. When he would go into their place of worship, he'd go into the Holy of Holies. There's this Ark of the Covenant, this box with the wings spread over it. And God said, it's there that I will meet with you and talk to you. In other words, when Moses would go in there, the very presence of God and the voice of God would speak to Moses as the leader of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. They knew that God was with them when they would see the pillar of fire at night and the cloud that covered them when they would walk in the daytime. That was God's symbol that I am present here. I am with you. Old Testament, God is over His people. In creation, as He began to put the tabernacle in place and His presence was with His people, God came to be with His people. And listen, you didn't walk into the presence of God with sin in your life. There was a time when the priestly group of Levi was so wicked that at the Day of Atonement, the high Day of Atonement, when they would go into the Holy of Holies to bring the blood before the mercy seat in the Ark of the Covenant, that they would fall dead in the presence of God. And they had to tie a rope to their ankles to pull them out of there. The presence of God. But when He was with them, when His presence was with them, they saw His power. They would see these great miracles of God. When they saw the presence of God with them, they knew God's going to take care of us. He'll provide for us. Remember, He would send the manna every day for them to be fed. He would send the flock uh, uh, to come in and fall so that they would have quail to have meat to eat. God would provide what they needed. When God's presence was with them, they knew things are going to be okay. God is with us. His presence is here. Now, why am I stressing this? But you see, in the New Testament, when we read the Scripture, we find that Jesus became Emmanuel, God with us. After this occasion, when Jesus was resurrected from the dead, what happens? We now have God in us. Old Testament, God over us. New Testament, with Jesus, God with us. Post-Pentecost, God in us. So when he says, you're going to get refreshing from the presence of God, what was he saying to them? When you're converted after you repent, God comes and lives in you. He is present in you. You don't have to have a high priest to talk to God for you. If I come to your home for a meal and you say, well, Brother Gordon, none of us in here know how to pray. We can't really talk to God. We need a priest, somebody who's really close to God. So we're going to ask you to pray. No, Brother Gordon doesn't have any better access to God than you do. Why? Because God's in you. He's present in you. Now, here's the question. In your Christian life this morning, are you refreshed? 
Is there joy? Are you, happy? Are you a happy Christian? That's a question. Are you a happy Christian? Or are you like me when I was a teenager boy and I dreaded going to church? I wouldn't have been there if Mama hadn't have made me go. And I just, I, I just, it was boring to me. And I'd go there and I couldn't wait for it to be over because I knew I don't have to do that again for another week. <laughs> How about you? Psalm 51, David had sinned against God. It had the husband, Bathsheba, killed. Uriah the Hittite, one of, one of his mighty men of valor because he had an affair with his wife. He's afraid he's going to get found out. So he sent word to the generals up at the front line, put Uriah the Hittite in the midst of the heat of the battle. And when he goes up to the front to fight, y'all withdraw and leave him up there by himself and make sure he's killed. And that's, that's what this king did. And one day a prophet of God comes and calls him out. You think your sin is hidden? Brothers and sisters, you can't hide your sin. First of all, there's nothing hidden from the sight of God. He knows everything that's going out. You say, well, I'm not hurting anybody. That's not the question. The question is, are you living by God's standard? That's the question. Are we living holy and pure lives? That's the question. And God knows everything. You think because you do it in darkness, he can't see it? No, no, no. The darkness is as the noonday. And once in a while, we think because God hasn't done anything about it, that we haven't suffered or we haven't been judged or no one came and talked to us about it, God must just kind of be overlooking it. And what we don't realize is that God is being patient to give us time to repent. But don't be fooled. If you're a child of God, he's not going to put up with it. It's only a matter of time. Correction will come. Why does he do that? Because he doesn't love us? No. In fact, the psalmist in the Proverbs says to us, you know why God corrects you? Because he loves you. If he leaves you on that track in unconfessed sin without his presence filling your life, without the Spirit of God empowering you, he is dooming you to a life of weakness, to a life of destruction. You'll never fulfill your potential as a child of God. So God corrects us. Any parent here who has a child that's going astray, when they're under your tutelage, under your house, under your rules, you have responsibility to keep them corrected, to keep them walking in the ways of God. Now, when they walk out, you're going to lose some of that. And some of you maybe have experienced that for yourself. But friends, when they do, you turn them over to the Spirit of God. Let Him handle it. He's a good, good corrector. Times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. There was a time in China back in the 30s uh, when the church was in a terrible state. I mean, it was, the churches were weak. We were losing missionaries out of China. In the Shandong province, a group of missionaries began to gather together to pray, to ask God to send a revival to the church of China. As they were praying, there was a couple there, uh, the Culpeppers, Dr. Charlie Culpepper and his wife um, had a, some retina problems and was losing her eyesight. They were going to have to come back to the States and leave their work. And Dr. Culpepper didn't want to do that. So he called his missionary friends and said, look, I don't know what else to do but to ask you all to come and pray for my wife, Ola, to be healed. And let's just, let's just put it in God's hands. If he wants to heal her, he can. If he doesn't choose to, we'll have to go back to America. So he said, now before we pray, I want to give you a few days to get your hearts right with God. So the missionaries went home. They prayed. They sought the Lord. Is there any sin in my life that needs to be confessed? Any relationship needs to be restored before we go for the prayer meeting? A friend of mine named Miss Bertha Smith, one of our early missionaries, single missionaries in China, was in that group. They came to Dr. Culpepper's house on the assigned day, went to the living room, and so he, he just shared with his missionary colleagues, look, I want us to get around Miss Ola here and we're just going to uh, put our hand on her and just pray and ask God to heal her. So they had a time of worship and came the time for prayer. 
Now, Miss Bertha is the one who told me this story. Miss Bertha said, as I was approaching Miss Ola to put my hand on her to pray, I looked across directly in front of me at one of my missionary colleagues. She and I were co-teachers at the girls' high school. And she said, as I was about to put my hand on Miss Ola's shoulder, the Spirit of God convicted me of my jealousy towards my missionary colleague. And Miss Bertha said, I, I, I was startled, I was kind of stunned that he waited until that moment to reveal it to me. She said, I, I argued with the Holy Spirit. I said, God, if you'll just let me go through the prayer time, when I get back to my house, I'll repent and I'll call her and, and make it right. And, he, and she said, I even said to the Lord, couldn't you have showed this to me yesterday so I could go and repent and confess it to her? Here I am in front of my colleagues and you want me to do this? And what was God dealing with in her life? Her pride. So Miss Bertha said, I just, she said, I was standing there and I knew, she said, I knew if I put my hand on this lady to pray with that sin in my life, knowing that sin's in my life, I know God is not going to do anything here. So Miss Bertha puts her hand back and says to her colleague, I owe you an apology. Miss Bertha confessed her jealousy to her colleague. What had happened was the school principal had retired and it was between her and this other lady as to who would be the next school principal of the girls' school. And Miss Bertha felt like she was more qualified, North Carolinian, master's in education, and she thought, I should be the one. I deserve to be the one. And they picked her colleague instead of her. And she had a prick of jealousy in her heart. When Miss Bertha apologized to her colleague, she said there was a time of restoration. She said my colleague came around, we hugged each other, and said when we did, uh, there was just a joy in the room. And she said what later I remember was the presence of God was there. And she said we began to praise the Lord because of His presence in the room. There was just a joy in our hearts. And she said as we were praising the Lord, one of the missionaries said, well, what about Miss Ola? Don't we need to pray for Miss Ola? And uh, when they said that, Miss Ola sitting in the chair, she had her head bowed as they were singing and worshiping. And Miss Ola, Miss Bertha said, she lifted her head up and she opened her eyes and she said, I've been healed. I can see. And then Miss Bertha said, they really got excited. That started a revival movement in the Shandong province. Miss Bertha said when she went back to the girls' high school and they had chapel services, God began to move amongst those high school girls. Miss Bertha said the presence of God was so heavy in the place that when the girls would come in for chapel services, many of them could not even stand up. They would go to their bench and bury their head under the bench in their hands and cry out to God for forgiveness. She said within two weeks, every girl at the high school had been converted. Then this revival movement spread out into these weak Chinese churches. Miss Bertha said you could go to one of these churches and the presence of God began to move in that place. And she said it wasn't uncommon that right in the middle of the service that people who would pass the doorway on the sidewalk of the city as they would pass would feel the presence of God fall under conviction and fall to their face on the concrete out in front of the church pleading with God for forgiveness. The presence of God. And in the course of that revival, over one million Chinese came to faith in Jesus Christ. Then persecution came. The communist government shut down the churches. They had public burnings of Bibles. They threw their pastors into prison. And they sought to stamp out this movement of Christianity. Many times pastors were killed. 
Do you know what happened to that revival movement? Today it's estimated over 100 million Chinese have come to faith. We have a relationship with three of the largest house church movements in China, and each of those is larger than 20 million. The power of the presence of God. And I want to ask you a question. When was the last time you experienced anything like that in your life? Where you were in a place and you knew God is here. God is here. Does it come in great thundering claps of lightning? Doesn't come with loud noise of, of the blowing of a wind? It can. Many times it comes with a very quiet, peaceful presence in which you know God is here. And you say, Brother Gordon, how would I know? Here's how you know. If the presence of God comes and you have unconfessed sin in your life and you feel comfortable, he wasn't there. I was invited to go to a country uh, church revival in Texas, a place, First Baptist Church in Milano. Church was in disunity, quarreling, a lot of bickering going on, people divided. You know, in country churches, I, I imagine it's true here, I don't know you, but you know, when I came to Macedonia Hicks Baptist Church as pastor, I was told, Brother Gordon, be careful, don't ever say anything about anybody to anybody because they're the relative of somebody. <laughs> now, I don't know if that's true in your church, but this church had gotten divided, and if you know what happens, it gets into families, and these families then pick sides in the church, and then they're bickering with each other. And I was invited to come to a revival there. My friend uh, who was near that area said, no, no, no. He said, you don't, you don't want to go there and preach that revival. I said, that church, I mean, they're just bickering with each other. Preachers are about to get run off. But I prayed about it, and I felt impressed to go. So I went, and, uh, you know, just preaching the Word of God. And, friends, something started happening. God began to move. And people began to get right with each other. People began to confess their sin to one another. People began to have their relationships stored. And then word began to get out in the community. Hey, folks, something's happening up there at First Baptist Milano. Those people actually like each other. <laughs> you see, your reputation is known. You think, oh, no, no, it's just us in here. Oh, no, no, no. People know the reputation of your church and the community. And that church had a terrible reputation. Well, as they got right with each other, guess what happened? The presence of the Lord. Oh, I wish you could have heard that singing. See, when God's in a place, boy, the joy of the Lord is there, and your heart is lifted to God in praise. You don't care what you sound like. Some of y'all ought to be singing out loud and you're a little embarrassed because you don't think you sound too good. Listen, it doesn't matter what anyone else thinks. It's what's in here. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And friends, that place became full of joy. You know what happened? People in the community started hearing about it and they said, we need to go down there and see what's going on. We finished the first week of revival. Deacons came to me and said, Brother Gordon, do you think you could come back for another week? I said, sure. We went another week. People in the community started coming in. Guess what happens when the joy of the Lord is in a place? It's contagious. People want to know the Lord. They want to know what changed your life. They want to know why you love your neighbor like you didn't before. They want to know how you were able to overcome that addiction. They want to know how you got healing. They want to know where your loneliness is gone and now you have the presence of God in your life. You're never alone again. They want to know that. People in the community began to come standing room only in that church. They began to get saved. Into the second week, here came the deacons. Brother Gordon, do you think we can go another week? We went for three weeks. Pastor's daughter was about to divorce her husband. Broken home. Arguing, fighting, fussing. His grandkids getting hurt in the process. 
And I'll never forget, they lived in another city, but she heard something's going on at my home church. Here came pastor's daughter. She was sitting about where you are, ma'am, on the very back row, sitting there, trying not to, for nobody to see him, just like I'm doing for you now. Uh, sitting there and hoping nobody would notice that she was, because the people in the church knew that she, her, her and her husband were having problems. They all knew. She was embarrassed, so she sat in the back. Here came the invitation. First one down the aisle. Went home. Got right with her husband. Marriage was healed and restored. Oh, friends, times of refreshing come from the presence of the Lord. The only thing that keeps His presence out of our life is sin, unconfessed sin. If you're a Christian, and it doesn't mean God hasn't forgiven you for your sin because once Jesus died on the cross, He paid the penalty for your sin. You don't have to pay for it. But He wants you to confess it and make it right. That's our job. As long as you hold on to it, you won't have the fullness of God. And you won't experience the presence of God. Doesn't mean you're lost. It means that you're left to trying to live out your Christian life in your own power and your own strength. And how's that working out for you? You can't do it by yourself. Oh, I know out in the country we're pretty hard, strong-willed, determined people. But friends, there's some walls you can butt your head up against until the cows come home and you'll never break it down. It'll ruin you. Some point in your life, you have to surrender to the presence and power of God. If you want to live the Christian life, then yield yourself to Him, surrender to Him. And let Him fill you with His presence and joy and empower you to live the Christian life. Very different. I'll close with this. In Africa, we were uh, living in the desert and. We had a little river that ran in front of our house. It would dry up in the summer heat. And there were these bullfrogs that lived in that river. When it would dry up, those bullfrogs would burrow down into the mud. And they would keep getting deeper and deeper until the dry mud on top of their head stopped. And then they'd just sit in that little cool, muddy spot and they'd wait. The next year, when the rainy season started and the river began to flow, the water would begin to filter down through that old dry mud, and finally the cool, new, wet water would come through that last bit of dry mud and touch that frog. Now, old bullfrog is so smart. He knows the river's back, and he starts crawling out of his muddy hole until he gets to the surface and finds that water, and he swims to the shore. Now, what do you think an extrovert frog who's been shut up all by himself for about seven months is going to do first night he's out of his hole? Well, he's going to croak to his heart's content. And they just start bellowing down there by that water, just cutting loose. First few nights, you can't sleep. But there's those old frogs, and they're starving to death. Behind our house, we had a little light that brought these insects in. That old smart frog would look over there and see that light and know there's something good to eat over there. So he jumps from the river to my back porch and sits under that light and eats those insects all night. Now his tummy's a little too full to go all the way back to the river. So you know what he did? He found my drain pipe to my shower. And he backs up in that drain pipe and he sits there until the next night. Well, even a bullfrog isn't that selfish. So you know what he does? In that drain pot, as it's getting dark and he's sitting there, he starts calling, Wah! come to the frog hotel. Wah! Wah! He starts bellowing down that pipe. And the next night, here comes two or three more frogs and join him. And then comes the morning when I'm trying to take a shower. And that water starts climbing up in the little shower. And I know I've had this problem before. So you know what I found out? Instead of turning the cold water on first, 
you turn that hot water on first. Boiling hot. And let me just tell you something. When that boiling hot water goes down that drain and hits frog number one, you got one of the funniest things happen you've ever seen in your life. I'd pour that hot water down there. I'd run around and watch, and here they come. I mean, they are coming out of that pipe. It's hilarious. And then the last one finally jumps out, and then here comes that old hot water following behind. Now, I want to first assure you, no animal was hurt in the course <laughs> of this experiment. <laughs> I had a missionary friend of mine one day. He said, hey, well, Gordon, why didn't you, like, just put a screen wire on it? And I said, well, where's the fun in that? You know, <laughs> I just love that. Now listen, here's where I tell you the story. And you're going to remember that story and you're going to remember this principle. That's what unconfessed sin does to our heart. That's how your spiritual vitality is drained away. You leave that unconfessed sin there and don't deal with it. It never lives by itself. It is always going to call for backup. You can never tell just one lie. You'll always have to tell another one to cover it. And the more you sin and leave that unconfessed sin in there, the more that pipe gets choked up. And now what does God want us to do? To confess our sin. That just means, God, if you point it out to me, you, if you tell me when you talk to Brother Buddy that way, that was wrong. What is confession? I say, Lord, you're exactly right. <laughs> I was dead wrong in that. That's what confession is. I agree with God. And what's the second step? If I've said hard words to Brother Buddy and I've confessed it to the Lord, you know what I'm supposed to do, don't you? What am I supposed to do? Get over there and apologize to Brother Buddy and make it right. That's the hard part. That's restoration. Now, friends, I don't know if you need to do some confession, but if you do, you stay at it until you're down to the bottom of the barrel and you've dealt with every single thing that God shows you. And when you get down there to the bottom of that barrel, and as far as you can, you've made restoration to every person that you know, you're going to find something happens to you. The Spirit of God who's living in you, who's been grieved because of our sin, is going to come out of that corner. He's going to take charge. And when He does, you're going to feel the joy of the Lord. And when you feel that joy of the Lord filling your heart, you're going to feel refreshed from the presence of the Lord. And that's what we need. May God help us do that. Let's pray. Father, we're about to sing a hymn, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. I pray that as we sing this hymn, that it's the testimony of our decision this morning before you, just between you and ourselves, between you and me, that I'm asking you, have your own way in me. If there's any person in this room, Lord, who's just tired of being miserable and unhappy and making other people miserable and unhappy, always finding fault and never anything good enough, and we know down inside the problem is down in our heart, and we need, we need a fresh move of your spirit in us. It's been so long since we had joy in our life, so long since we just yearned for the Word of God to get on our knees and pray and talk to you and that something in our heart that it was so exciting that we couldn't help but share our testimony with the people that we meet because we found you to be a good and gracious and merciful God. Oh, Father, uh, your arm is not short today. Your ear is not deaf. Uh, you're listening. You want to touch us and move in us and restore us and cleanse us. And so as we sing this hymn together, just let that be our testimony. And the days to come, would you just work a new work in our lives and hearts? 
because we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, friends, and our hymn is hymn number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. 294. And as I was praying, let that be your testimony today. As you sing this hymn, let these words really be your decision between you and the Lord this morning. Let's sing together, 294. presence of God with you all through the rest of this day. And that his hand would guide you. Your feet would just walk on the highway of his holiness this week. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might as unto the Lord. Wherever your feet take you, don't be ashamed that God wants to find you in that place. Whatever your eyes see, whatever words your mouth speaks, when you lay your head down on your pillow tonight, let it be something that's pleasing to the Lord. And may His blessings rest upon you all the days of your long, 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 long life. Be blessed in His name today. Let's do this next. Amen.